Even at church abuses is because we are all practical Christians. In other words, we have embraced Christian morality even if we don't embrace the Christian God. So that would be a short answer. And it's not a religious answer. I'm giving you a secular answer for the impact Christian, Christianity has had in the world. If Christianity had not existed, this would be a very different civilization. Many good things that you value in life would not exist. So we are, life would be more nasty, sordid, brutish, and short. Christianity has made our world better. I guess just briefly that uh, where I began, that it's a, a huge, complex phenomenon, social phenomenon, religion, Christianity, and you, you can't really separate it in a counterfactual, what if there never was Christianity, it's impossible to know, it's so deeply embedded, and in grand, it's done great things, it's done terrible things, and so on, and here we are, on this journey. Uh, I guess one of the things I learned the most, I wrote a book on uh, the Holocaust deniers with a a Orthodox uh, uh, Jew, Jewish historian. And anyway, so we spent a lot of time going around all the camps one summer, uh, all the ex-death camps in Europe. And so I, I learned a lot about Orthodox Judaism. One of, one of the things, although he wasn't super extreme to Orthodox, but one of the things I learned was from him that the commentaries over the centuries, really millennium, by the great Jewish scholars, of which there are hundreds of them, uh, showed me that the sort of the process of debate and disputation was as important, if not more important, than the final answers you end up with. And that it's deeply important to have at least given deep and, uh, and careful thought to everything you're doing. Maybe even more important than what you end up deciding, that at least you did that. And for that I really admire a Judaism as a developing that whole process of debate and disputation, and that's what we're doing here. Mr. D'Souza, would you care to take a moment? Um, if you can keep it short, that'd be great. <laughs> certainly, certainly no longer than two minutes for a closing remark. You know, there's a story that was told about um, uh, Mother Teresa, and it was that she was um, in Calcutta um, hugging uh, a leper. And um, an Indian guy was passing and looked at her and said, uh, why are you doing that? He said, I would not do that for all the money in the world. And she said to him, um, I wouldn't either. I'm not doing it for the money in the world, I'm doing it for the love of Christ. Now, I wouldn't deny for a moment that non-religious people can live well and do good things, um, but I would suggest that the supreme sacrifices that you see in people like Mother Teresa reflect that other dimension. We see from Mother Teresa's diaries that this, this was actually not even in some ways a reciprocated love. In a sense, she loved God and she, from her experiential point of view, God didn't love her back. She never felt it for years. And you might say, well, that makes her kind of a doubter in the sense that, yeah, I'm a doubter too. When Michael Shermer says, I don't know and you don't either, I'm happy to sign on the dotted line. I don't know. If I knew, how could I believe? I wouldn't say I believe in my brother. I know the guy. <laughs> the reason you believe is because you don't know. So the believer shares with the agnostic the not knowingness. The real difference here, it seems to me, is really this. And it's ultimately that there are questions about life that are beyond the realm of experience, but it is, I think, a very shallow answer to say, since we don't know, we don't decide, we wait until the knowledge comes in, only because the knowledge will never, it's sort of like this, I'm, on a, I'm in love with a woman, I'm trying to decide whether I should marry her. Now, I'm waiting for the data. What's the data? How will life be like with her for the next 45 years? My point is, it doesn't matter how long we date, I'm never going to know that. I have to decide, do I ask her to marry or no? I even respect the atheist who says no. The agnostic, I'm going to wait till the data comes in. <laughs> well, either she'll marry somebody else or you'll both be dead. <laughs> so my point is, there are things in life which matter to us. We need, we need ultimately to decide if we want to live in a world 
of mystery and miracle, a world in which the sublime is a part of everyday life? Or do we want to live in a demystified world, a world in which nothing is miraculous? And to me, that, that world is a little bit grayer, darker, not a world that in a sense makes sense of the wonder of our existence. It's ultimately the wonder of our existence, which is I think at the root of it, mysterious, that inclines me to the idea of the supernatural. I have no hostility to people who are, who are Jews or Buddhists, because I think they share that sense of transcendence. For me, it is best expressed within Christianity, but for all believers it is expressed in this idea of something more. So my book, What's So Great About Christianity, written not just for Christians, it is in part to give a secular argument for Christianity, but one that would appeal to all seekers, and I think also uh, as a challenge to atheists. To ultimate, even atheism requires a kind of skeptical challenge to the skeptical, not only of religion, but also skeptical <coughs> of skepticism. That's what I'm trying to deliver. Thank you. It's a good book, by the way. I recommend it. <laughs> On the other side. Dr. Sharma, would you care to close it in? Yes, I'm going to just read a final couple passages from my book, uh, Why Darwin Matters, the final epilogue. I began the epilogue with a trip I took to the Esalon Institute in Big Sur, California, which is sort of a hotbed of New Age, Timothy Leary kind of experiences people have, although apparently they don't do drugs now like they used to back in the 60s. Um, and there I, I kind of discovered, um, I mean, Mr. Skeptic at the Esalon Institute, right? I mean, this is sort of a hotbed of angels and all this sort of New Age uh, flap doodle, as we would call it. But in fact, <laughs> when I look past the, whatever the particular things people believe that I didn't, I could see that these folks were all on a journey, the same kind of journey that I'm on, the same kind of journey that Dinesh is on, that we're all on, trying to you know, make sense of the world. And so since I'm a science guy, I, you know, that's sort of the perspective I bring to it. And, and uh, so I write, does a scientific explanation for the world diminish its spiritual beauty? I think not. Science and spirituality are complementary, not conflicting. Additive, not detractive. Anything that generates a sense of awe may be a source of spirituality. Science does this in spades. I'm deeply moved, for example, when I observe through my 8-inch reflecting telescope in my backyard the fuzzy little patch of light that is the Andromeda galaxy. It's not just because it is lovely, but because I also understand that the photons of light landing on my retina left Andromeda 2.9 million years ago when our ancestors were tiny-brained hominids roaming the plains of Africa. I'm doubly disturbed because it was not until 1923 that the astronomer Edwin Hubble, using the 100-inch telescope on Mount Wilson, just above my home in the foothills of Pasadena, discovered that this nebula was actually an extragalactic stellar system of immense size and distance. Hubble subsequently discovered that the light from the most uh, from most galaxies is shifted toward the red end of this electromagnetic spectrum, literally unweaving a rainbow of colors, meaning that the universe is expanding away from an explosive creation. It was the first empirical evidence indicating that the universe had a beginning and thus is not eternal. What could be more awe-inspiring, more numinous, magical, spiritual than this cosmic visage? Mount Wilson Observatory is the Shark Cathedral of our time. I write that because I, I've been in Shark, which is also a very spiritually moving place to go. Um, what science tells us is that we are but one among hundreds of millions of species that evolved over the course of three and a half billion years on one tiny planet among many orbiting an ordinary star, itself one of possibly billions of solar systems in an ordinary galaxy that contains hundreds of billions of stars itself located in a cluster of galaxies not so different from the millions of other galaxy clusters, themselves whirling away from one another in an accelerating, expanding cosmic bubble universe that very possibly is only one among a near infinite number of bubble universes. Herein lies the spiritual side of science. It's scientuality, if you'll pardon an awkward neologism, but one that echoes the sensuality of discovery. If religion and spirituality are supposed to generate awe and humility in the face of the Creator, what could be more awesome and humbling than the deep space discovered by Hubble and the cosmologists and the deep time discovered by Darwin? 
and the evolutionists. So Darwin matters because evolution matters, and evolution matters because science matters, and science matters because it is the preeminent story of our age, an epic saga about who we are, where we came from, and where we're going. time and your energy and your attention. Uh, it's been clearly an exciting event. Um, as, you, as you exit, please uh, plan on visiting the, uh, the, the table um, in the back. Uh, obviously, our, our authors have had chances to, uh, to let their books shine in front of an audience, which is fantastic if you're a writer. Um, take time to visit with them, sign their books. Also, visit the, um, the Socratic Club table and pick up one of these so you can check out the events to come and events that work. Thank you very much.